Guys, really excited to be joined today by Nathan Thrall. He is an American uh, author and essayist and also a really astute observer and analyst of what has been going on between Israel and the Palestinians for many years. Um, he was actually the uh, director of the Arab-Israeli project at the International Crisis Group and is out with a new book. And we want to talk about all of those things and much more. Great to have you, Nathan. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, so first of all, just tell people a little bit about your new book, Day in the Life of Abed Salama, Anatomy of a Jerusalem Tragedy. Um, what brought you to want to write the book? And then we can talk a little bit about the uh, the reaction on the other side of that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I actually um, came to this story for for a number of, of reasons. One was just a, a personal and emotional one. I live in Jerusalem and um, the community where Abed Salama, the main protagonist of this book, lives, is just two miles away from, from me. And it's um, a walled ghetto. It's walled on three sides, with a fourth side is a separate kind of wall. There's a segregated road running alongside of it, um, with a, a, a um, traffic on one side for Palestinians, traffic on the other side for Israelis, and a big wall running through the middle. So this walled ghetto is partly inside the same city that I live in. And um, I would pass by it on a daily or weekly basis and hardly pay it any mind. And there was a, an enormous tragedy, which I'll, I'll describe in a moment, that um, that struck the uh, members of this community. And after that, I couldn't stop thinking about the parents and the children um, inside of it and what a different life they live inside my same city. So that was kind of the emotional reason. There was also a higher order uh, reason that I wanted to write about something um, that happens all over the world, happens every day, uh, a tragic uh, car accident, and not to write about a war in Gaza or an invasion of Janine or something that is you know, more naturally the subject of a, of a journalist book, because what I wanted was to draw our attention to the ordinary, everyday lives of Palestinians and Jews in this uh, grossly unjust system that is continually leading to more and more bloodshed. And my part of the desire to write this book came out of a frustration from um, seeing how the world turned its eyes to Israel-Palestine only when we had uh, a spike in violence, a war in Gaza. And when that happened, everybody would say, we need to have a ceasefire and restore calm. So, but what is the calm that we are restoring? The calm that we're restoring is a deeply, deeply unjust system where 7 million Jews, 7 million Palestinians, all living under Israeli rule, the vast majority of those Palestinians don't have basic civil rights. And uh, and I wanted to describe that system and what it's like to live in that system and to understand that we can't uh, call for a restoration of calm when there's a war in Gaza. We can't leave it at that. We need to address uh, that system and, and, and to undo that injustice, which the United States is, of course, uh, supporting. Um, so this, the story that I tell is of a... Um, tragic uh, uh, car accident uh, that happened just outside of Jerusalem. Uh, I tell the story uh, of a man, Abid Salama, who lives in this walled ghetto that I described. His, his community is called Anata. Also within this walled ghetto is the Shuafat refugee camp. And one night, uh, Abid's son, Milad, asks him to go and buy some um, treats for a kindergarten class trip that he's taking the next day. And the next uh, morning, there's a storm and Milad boards his bus with his kindergarten class, about 50 kindergartners on this uh, bus. On the other side of the wall is the Jewish settlement uh, of Pisgat Ze'ev, an East Jerusalem, quote unquote, neighborhood. Uh, Israel doesn't refer to the East Jerusalem settlements as set settlements, and often the U.S. Um, also will refer to them as neighborhoods rather than settlements. But Pisgat Ze'ev is just on the other side of this wall, and there are playgrounds there that these kids could not go to, because in this walled ghetto, half of the parents have a blue ID that allows them to enter Jerusalem. Half of them have a green ID 
that uh, for, prevents them from entering Jerusalem. And the kids on this bus couldn't just go to the nearby uh, play area on the other side of the wall. So instead, they followed this winding path of the wall to a distant uh, uh, play area near uh, Ramallah. And as they passed uh, a checkpoint, they were struck by a giant uh, semi-trailer, a semi-trailer that was going back and forth from an East Jerusalem factory to a settlement quarry, uh, where it was picking up stones that would be brought to the factory. And, and these stones that are extracted illegally for the natural resources of the West Bank, they're used to pave the roads uh, in Israel. And, um, and so this, this semi-trailer slams into the school bus. The bus flips over, it catches fire, and who is left to deal with this uh, uh, bus in flames filled with kindergartners are all of the Palestinian bystanders, most of whom who live on the other side of the wall. And the bystanders are uh, trying to rescue these soot-covered kids from this bus and they're loading them into the backs of their private uh, vehicles. And again, the people who live in this area, they have different colored IDs. Some have the blue ID that lets them go to Jerusalem. Some have the green ID. And what happened was if you had a blue ID and you put a kindergartner in the back seat of your car, you would drive off to the superior nearby hospitals in Jerusalem. And if you had a green ID, you would take um, a kindergartner in the opposite direction toward toward Ramallah, or some went even to Nablus. And Abed and other parents, when they heard about the crash, they raced uh, to the scene. The Israeli army had blocked off the road, wasn't letting cars pass. Abed got out of his the car that he was riding in uh, and started running uh, toward the accident site. He flagged down an army jeep told them in Hebrew that his kid was on the bus. They refused to give him a lift just a couple minutes up the road. And he runs to the scene and he sees a crowd there and he looks and he sees um, this burned out bus and no children anywhere. And he's asking, where are the kids? And they, he's told that they're in a this Jerusalem hospital in another Jerusalem hospital at the military base that's just a minute up the road at a Ramallah hospital. And he can't go to most of these places. He can't enter the military wow. base. He himself has a green ID. He can't go to Jerusalem to look for his kid. Uh, and so he winds up going to Ramallah. And I tell the story of this more than 24 hour period where Abed is navigating this horrible bureaucracy on the worst day of his life to try and find his ch child, his, his five-year-old son, Milad. And I also tell the story in the crash of other people whose lives intersect on the day of the crash. I, a settler paramedic, a, um, uh, a mother and doctor who works for UNRWA, a Palestinian doctor who helps pull kids off the bus and, and, you know, all of these people who are living in close proximity, but living totally separate and unequal lives that, that collide on the day of this crash. And one of the, the may I'll just finish just the, the one sure. of the main um, uh, tragedies of this book is that the people on the other side of this wall live in a state of utter neglect. And even in this walled ghetto wh where the parents and teachers live, you know, there are virtually no municipal services. People are forced to burn trash in the middle of the street. This is all happening just underneath the manicured grounds of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. The, the, you can be at this, the most prestigious university in Israel and look down on a checkpoint and parents and teachers waiting in line uh, to just go to their schools and work. And there is no infrastructure in this place and no playground, no uh, lanes in the road, uh, not even a wide enough road for me to go in one direction and the bus to go in the other on the main artery of this road, not a single ATM. And it's so bad that the emergency services even will be prevented from entering without an army or police escort. Wow. And so the crash really embodied 
the utter neglect of this area and the very fact that all these bystanders were pulling these kids off and taking them themselves to the hospital so that by the time the first Israeli fire truck arrived more than a half hour later, all the kids had been evacuated. So I think part of what makes um, this particular story, which I want to make clear to everyone, these are real events that happen to real people, is that it isn't during wartime. It isn't during these sparks of attention and awareness. And it takes the sort of tragedy, which is the worst nightmare of any human, certainly any parent, and stitches it together with something that is very foreign to most people, which is the day-to-day -day indignities and reality of living under occupation. So to me, this is exactly the sort of story that people should be engaging with right now to understand the status quo reality outside of the current war that's being waged on Gaza. And yet, talk to us about the uh, the reception of the book, and I'll ask a very loaded loaded question. How is the book promotion going at this point? Yeah. Um, so um, there has been, um, as you know, it just um, a major setback for um, all of the progress that had been made in the United States in terms of just being able to say the word occupation, just being able to have any kind of sympathetic um, understanding of Palestinian life under occupation. And uh, since uh, the, the war began, it has been a hyper-polarized and intolerant environment. And there had been groups that would have tried to cancel my events or to try and prevent me from speaking or from people hearing about the book prior to October 7th. And I think they wouldn't have had gotten much traction except on, mm. the, on the far right. Now, after October 7th, they're succeeding. And so I have had multiple events canceled. I had the UK police shut down um, the biggest event of my book tour, uh, citing uh, public safety, um, and an event at Conway Hall in London. Uh, I have had um, synagogues cancel, a very progressive synagogue that, you know, they were co-sponsored by progressive Jewish organizations that were involved in promoting the book and thought this was an important book for their constituency to read uh, prior to October 7th. And now they just say, we cannot, we cannot do it. And um, I was going to speak at a, at a Palestinian uh, conference this weekend, um, uh, the uh, U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights. There was pressure put on the Hilton Hotel in Houston that was hosting them, and they had to cancel the entire conference. I mean, left and right, events are being canceled. Rev even reviews of the book are being held that are filed because wow. it's their positive reviews, I'm told, of a book that is sympathetically portraying um, the lives of Palestinians under occupation. Now, I should say also that, you know, what what's really telling about this is that the book also portrays the lives of Jews, including settlers, uh, sympathetically as well. I mean, I am trying to paint real human beings and show what their perspectives are and really put you in the shoes of Jews and Palestinians living in this place. So when I was interviewed about the book prior to October 7th, there was an outlet that I really respect, uh, Dawn, um, Democracy for the Arab World Now, that interviewed me and the interviewer asked me a series of questions about whether I had portrayed the Jewish settlers and therefore the settler movement too sympathetically. Mm. And for me, I was very happy to be asked that question. That was a victory because I wanted this book to be real and to really put you in the shoes of, of everybody there and understand how they see the world. So the fact that a book that got asked that kind of question before October 7th is being the targeted uh, for, for cancellation and, you know, I'm not the only one. So many uh, Palestinian voices and even, you know, you've heard the story about MSNBC not allowing the three anchors who are most uh, sympathetic to Palestinians to, to have their shows air in the normal way. They used a pretext, but 
It is just a time of total intolerance. And every Palestinian in the US that I know says it feels like the days after 9-11 or the lead up to the Iraq war. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that certainly seems like the atmosphere to me as well. Just, um, you know, there's been lots of discussion about cancel culture uh, in uh, American colleges and universities and in media, et cetera. Um, but I'm not sure that I've seen anything that has been quite as aggressive or quite as complete as the shutdown of any sort of um, voices that are sympathetic to Palestinians just as human beings. And just to be clear, it's not like your book is not like, go Hamas, yay yeah. civilian death. I mean, they're really, in my opinion, I'm, I'm in the midst of reading it and I read the original essay that it uh, was based on. There is nothing that should even be controversial because it really is a, you know, a, a journal, a narrative, but journalistic retelling of real events that happened with real human beings. One thing that I was curious about from your perspective, um, you know, you're an American, you're a Jew, you live in Jerusalem. How easy is it living there to be oblivious to the lives of the Palestinians who are living just over the border in this walled ghetto? So easy. I mean, the whole, the whole success of this decades long system of injustice depends on it being easy for the vast majority of Israeli Jews to ignore it and to not feel it. And, and I mean, I live in Jerusalem. I'm working on uh, reporting on the Palestinians and I'm passing by this walled ghetto and not thinking about the people on the other side. Imagine all the other Israelis who don't think about Palestinians uh, at all. I'm not Israeli, but imagine all the Israelis who are passing by and, and, uh, and, and that's in Jerusalem where you're confronted with a large Palestinian population that's living in the same city. If you want to talk about Tel Aviv and the greater Tel Aviv area, you know, that is a, a, an area with very, very few Palestinians in it. And if you are a liberal living in, in Tel Aviv, you can live your entire life not even thinking about the existence of an occupation. And it's just a few miles away. Um, so the whole system depends on your average Israeli being able to tune this out completely, including, you know, really well-meaning people who might be against the occupation. But if you, you make it so comfortable for everybody to be a part of the system, um, then it, the, the system can, can persist indefinitely. And how do you think that the um, horrific massacre perpetrated by Hamas on October 7th, how do you think that that has shaken uh, Israelis and their view of the status quo? It is impossible to overstate the degree to which it did precisely that. It has shaken an entire country. Um, and, you know, on a per capita basis, this is a much bigger event than 9-11 for uh, Israelis. U.S. invaded, you know, two countries, reshaped the Middle East, changed its own domestic laws in the wake of 9-11. And that was with, you know, attackers that came from, you know, more than an ocean away. And here you have... 20% of the population of Israel proper with citizenship who are Palestinian and they are living right there in this country. And there are many people who will try to blame them and, and you know, the collective punishment of Gazans for what Hamas did is something that everybody is supporting now. But there will be also consequences for Palestinians who don't even live in Gaza, Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinians in the West Bank, for the first time in my professional life, I can actually see a future that descends into Balkan style, civil on civil uh, conflict. And of course, one party in that conflict will have all of the guns and all of the power. Um, and so, but to answer your question, it, you know, it is so mainstream to now talk about, um, uh, you know, wiping out Gaza. Do you have the center left president of the country who is the former head of the center left labor party of Israel in a speech prepared remarks, not off the cuff. There are no innocents in Gaza. 
I mean, it's, it is unbelievable. If that is what the left uh, half of the spectrum in Israel is saying, you, you, it, you just cannot overstate the degree to which Israelis are in a deep, deep state of shock, again, because the system had protected them for so long. They never expected this to happen. This is out of their worst nightmares. And the consequences for Israeli psychology, Israeli society, for the future of Israel-Palestine are, are, are very far-reaching, and we're just at the very beginning of, of it. That was part of what I wanted to get from you to Nathan, because I heard you talking on a podcast a while back with uh, Peter Beinart. And you were talking about, you know, we get caught up in these debates on the left, like, should it be a two-state solution? Should it be a one-state solution? What does this look like? Is it Algeria? Is it South Africa? And you made this point of, what if it's America? What if the colonizers win? And to me, you've had all this language from Netanyahu and his government of like, all right, we're just, you know, we're going into Gaza and we don't even know what comes next. And I sort of think that's bullshit because it's not like they've been unclear about what their ideal goal for um, all of the occupied Palestinian territories, including Gaza, would be. And that's complete annexation. I mean, a think tank with some ties to Netanyahu just put out a plan that laid out exactly how they would, um, you know, achieve this quote unquote final settlement solution. And so to me, it seems more likely that they know exactly what they want to do. They just don't want to say it publicly for fear of, losing the support of the U.S. or an attempt to try to save face for the U.S. and for President Biden. I wonder if you're reading it the same way. So the way that I'm reading it is uh, Israel has no idea what to do. I actually think, of course, you know, their ideal solution, the government's ideal solution would have been to expel the Palestinians from Gaza and push them into uh, Egyptian Sinai. And it is very clear from uh, the statements by Secretary of State Blinken after his meeting with um, the Egyptian president, uh, Sisi, that the US was actually shopping around this idea And Blinken made this statement after meeting with Sisi saying explicitly, um, we have heard from our Arab partners that the idea of moving the Palestinians of Gaza into another country or into Sinai is a non-starter and therefore we're not pursuing it. I mean, can you believe that the American Secretary of State is not taking a principled stand against the forcible transfer of 2.3 million innocent civilians to another country. And the U.S. was actually attempting to to facilitate that. And who knows what they were offering the Egyptians in order to absorb 2.3 million uh, Palestinians. It is unthinkable that the U.S. could could openly support such a thing. Uh, And so... Absolutely, that was Israel's hope. I don't think, I don't think that they can achieve it. Uh, I think they can. It's possible that the way that this war will evolve is that as Israeli ground troops go in, and if they bomb a certain way, and then they open, they bomb open essentially the border with Sinai, that you could have many Palestinians fleeing into Sinai. And the Egyptians will not like it. They will test the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, but Egypt may not break it. They may have to swallow it at first and then push for those refugees to to go back. But we know how that worked in 1948. They never were permitted to go back. Um, So that's clearly what Israel's preference would be that the Palestinians of Gaza go to Egypt. I think it's very hard for them to achieve it. And their stated goal, if we forget about even what they're going to do with the Palestinian civilians of Gaza, their stated goal with respect to Hamas is also almost impossible to achieve. Yeah. And so they are, they, I think they really are at a loss for what to do because if they go in and they try and, you know, blow up tunnels in Gaza, and they're going to go and, you know, inch their way down and try and quote, unquote, eliminate Hamas, which is what they 
they claim they want to do. This is a, a you know movement that's deeply rooted in Palestinian society. They, there is no way to actually eliminate Hamas. There is a way to kill many, many Palestinians and many militants inside Hamas. Um, and wh how they're going to end this without killing all of their hostages. There are, you know, over 200 uh, people uh, being held hostage in, in, in Gaza is, again, another impossible task. What I'm told is, is that they're, um, th th that the scale of the killing on October 7th is so great that there is a totally new Israeli attitude toward hostages. Gone is the day wow. of trading 1,000 plus for one soldier, 1,000 plus Palestinian prisoners for one soldier, as happened uh, with Gilad Shalit in 2011, I believe it was. Um, uh, and, and now I think the attitude that some Israeli officials are expressing in private is this is uh, such a priority for us, such a, a more important goal of actually eliminating Hamas that, um, that, you know, essentially we're prepared to lose another 200. I mean, putting aside um, the atrocities and collective punishment and bombing of, you know, civilian facilities and the thousands of Palestinians in Gaza who have already lost their lives, We've spoken with, um, you know, we, we've listened to the analysis of military experts who were involved in Iraq, involved in Afghanistan, said if your goal is actually elimination of Hamas and you want to do this counterinsurgency type thing, stop bombing because you're going to need some cooperation from the local people. It's not going to be easy. You're going to suffer casualties, et cetera. But what you're doing now is actually totally counterproductive to your stated goal and objective which even if you went about it in the way that these, you know, military experts who, by the way, had to work out for us in Iraq and Afghanistan suggest is likely, as you're suggesting, an impossible task. And even if you were able to root out Hamas, given the blockade and the misery that's inflicted on Gaza on a regular basis, what kind of political structure and what kind of political ideology do you think is going to grow out of the, Hamas, the ashes of Hamas? It's going to look very similar to what we already have. So with all that being said, Nathan, you know, you have been, you are a student of this conflict. You wrote another book called um, The Only Language They Understand, talking about, you know, flare-ups of violence and how that has impacted, set back, move forward, potential negotiations, potential compromises. You know, do you have any expectations for what, what the end of this looks like and where we end up after all of the, the dust and the misery and the death and the carnage um, is behind us? It's so hard to predict even just a few days into the future to think about, you know, months or years into the future is, is, is almost impossible. Um, but what I think that you just mentioned is really important to stress is that even if we ignore the question of, of immediately what Israel is going to do in Gaza and how deeply they're going to go in and whether they stop bombing and whether they go in with ground troops, etc., um, there is no exit strategy. There is no plausible answer to how, if they really eliminate Hamas, how they're going to ever leave Gaza, who's going to be in charge in Gaza. I lived in Gaza for, uh, you know, six weeks as my, as the very beginning of my work with the International Crisis Group. And the report that I wrote was about uh, uh, Salafi jihadi opposition to Hamas. And that was, you know, in 2010, that uh, that kind of opposition to Hamas, which is way to the right of where Hamas is, hmm. you know, that's the kind of thing that could replace uh, Hamas. And and Israel cannot put the Palestinian Authority in in place on the back of Israeli tanks uh, in, in Gaza what what international force is going to agree to go and facilitate Israel's you know occupation of uh, of of Gaza so i think israel really is at uh, a, a crossroads and it has no answer that its public is demanding something that it can't actually do um which is an extraordinarily dangerous uh situation and what are the forces that you think would hold 
Israel and Netanyahu and the most extreme government in Israeli history back from complete annexation? Um, I think that, you know, de facto, they are, they've already annexed, you know, the West Bank. The possibility of reestablishing settlements in Gaza was something unthinkable. Uh, it was something people did say on the right, including people within the current Israeli government, but it sounded like lunacy three weeks ago. And today you can actually imagine it. I don't think Israel wants to annex Gaza unless they succeed in getting rid of a huge number of Palestinians within Gaza. So if hundreds of thousands or a million or some huge chunk of the Palestinians, of the 2.3 million Palestinians who live in Gaza are expelled, uh, then I think you could imagine an Israeli annexation. But um, but if there are 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza, Israel has no interest in actually annexing that territory and their model is something different, which is walling it off. As actually, you know, the characters in my book, it's the same strategy. You have a densely populated Palestinian area that you have no hope of settling with, with Jewish settlements. It's too dense. There isn't enough space. There would be too much resistance. It'd be too costly. And so what do you do? You wall it off. You segregate that population. So that's the strategy of Gaza. And that's increasingly the model that you see in the West Bank of these Bantustans that are created there. So um, again, if they clear Gaza of many, many Palestinians, annexation becomes a possibility. But without that, I think um, at most, they would just annex, you know, a portion of it or declare that they've made a buffer zone that mm. they're now occupying. Um, and maybe they would say, you know, we will leave when we get the hostages back or something along those lines. Um, well, Nathan, thank you so much for um, spending some time with us. Um, you know, the book is fantastic. I really encourage people to go out and get it because it does help you understand on a visceral level what it is like to live under occupation, the way it shapes every aspect of your life, your relationships, your work, your day-to-day, -day, just how you're driving down the, war the road, even outside of this um, horrific tragedy. The book is called Day in the Life of Abed Salama, Anatomy of a Jerusalem Tragedy. Tell people where they can find it, Nathan, and where they can find you. Um, my website is uh, nathanthrall.com and the book can be found anywhere books are sold. There's an audio book version of it as well. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for your analysis and your insights today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.